Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News and let's just go ahead and jump right on into this because my oh my did I think it was actually going to be a kind of slow news week but then the Hugo Awards just decided to light themselves on fire for us all to see and I want to be very clear, this is a complex situation that is being somewhat misrepresented online, but is also a worse scandal than those people who are kind of getting it wrong or making it out to be. So let's go ahead and dive on into this, and I'm not kidding, really to explain what is happening here and unravel this ball, we're going to jump back all the way to 2021. And before we get into it, massive shout out to Mr. Philip, more specifically Mr. Philip's library.wordpress.com for doing a very complex comprehensive write-up of this situation. And normally I don't trust just random blog posts like this, but not only are they including receipts that match a lot of the information I was finding, but they've updated their article repeatedly for corrections and additional information. And that's usually a very good sign. This is someone who's actually really caring about getting this right. So shout out to them. All of this, of course, linked down below, but let's go ahead and jump back to 2021, where in DC a vote was held on where the 2023 Worldcon should be held. Now, Worldcon is important to Hugo Awards because that's the convention where the Hugo Awards are held. And there is no grand committee that then decides who wins the Hugo Awards. That actually is done by the host of the convention that year. Worldcon does have a committee, but the Hugo Awards are handled at that level. Already some fishiness comes into play because the two big competitors for 2023 were Canada and China. And it seems in a flurry of last minute, mostly online votes that lacked a street address, China ran away with the victory. There apparently was an effort to negate all ballots that lacked a street address. And this involves like a constitution that the organization runs by and fans present at the business meeting passed the resolution 47 to 30. However, the motion was non-binding and a DizCon 3 chair overruled it. Therefore, China won the bid to host Worldcon in 2023. Already, this did generate some backlash. People were upset that with the ongoing human rights that are actually still happening to this day in China, they should not be selected to host Worldcon. But the way Worldcon functions, no one has the power to change that. By design, Worldcon is entirely in the hands of whoever is hosting it. And so it then fell into the hands of China to disqualify themselves based on their own human rights violations. And they didn't do that. I'm shocked. Now, in the months leading up to Worldcon, there were continued issues, not only technical difficulties on the actual voting website, but voting was closed April 30th, but the finalists weren't announced until July 6th. And now our scandal that everyone's already talking about online begins because very large authors who are sweeping other awards were just clearly left off from even being finalists within the Hugo Awards, most notably Rebecca Kwong for her book, Babel. Now, some authors do decline nominations, especially if it's being hosted in a country like this, but that was not the case here. Normally within a day, hours after the actual Hugo Awards are held, the full voting statistics are released for the ceremony. That just happened to not happen this time. A Hugo subcommittee member named Dave McCarty did post to his personal Facebook about this delay saying, the detailed Hugo stats are delayed entirely because of my poor understanding of how swamped I was gonna be on site. This delay is purely to make sure that everything I put over is verified as correct. And the detailed stats take time to verify. There's lots of stuff going on here. Adding onto this saying, which is worse, delaying the publisher or putting out detailed information with mistakes that the public catches. I think faulty information is immensely more damaging than the late information. And as the person that's actually responsible for protecting the reputation of the event this year, to the best of my ability, we're going to go with my call on how to do it. We knew we were going to get them eventually though, because the constitution this convention bases itself off of says that they must be released within 90 days of the convention. The last possible moment that they were finally put out. I don't know if that's when he was handed them or just when he decided, oh, we're not going to be able to avoid this problem anymore. Because when the statistics for the finalists in the 2023 Hugo Awards were finally announced, there were a whole bunch of books that people thought should be there that made it to the finalists. They just had a asterisk next to their name and a notation down below that they were simply 
not eligible. Now, there are other asterisks within here as well, saying, oh, the author rejected the nomination, or they were not eligible because the author was a part of the convention and they did not want to have some kind of perceived bias. But for these specific authors, the asterisks just said not eligible with no further detail given. From what I've been able to see, there are at least two other authors that have been disqualified and a critic named Paul Weimer. This includes Jiren J. Zhao, who apparently has been deemed ineligible two years in a row, though I need to find more concrete information about that. Although Jiren J. Zhao has just said it on their Twitter. Now I have far less grace for this Dave character when it comes to his response when he was asked why these people were disqualified without reason. They stated, after reviewing the constitution and the rules we must follow, the administration team determined those works slash persons were not eligible. When followed up on that, the response came back, asked and answered, and then, are you slow? And then, you can't parse a sentence in what I assume is your native language. I. I just want to say here that to get these screenshots, I had to do a bit of a deep dive in this Facebook conversation that's happening publicly. I'm not doxing anyone here. That's why you see people like Neil Gaiman responding to this post. And I just want to say, even if there isn't some big censorship thing happening here, right? There's some explanation provided. Just the response and tone to very legitimate questions from people's, again, whose careers could be hugely affected by this is so despicable in my opinion from your chairman that uh do you hear that sound it's credibility just going away Ooh, and in the face of people like neil and this does make me go back to Dave's statements about faulty information, where we now have multiple people going through the release statistics and calling not only these asterisk disqualifications being bull, but also the numbers not making sense to then say, um, Dave, in your native language, this reeks of dog butthole. Particularly observant viewers of this video might note a common thread among the authors who were disqualified. Either they were LGBTQ plus or openly critical of the Chinese government. And in a final update from Dave, who again is handling all of this, when asked if he was being compelled by the Chinese communist government, he responded, that I will categorically deny. Nobody has ordered me to do anything. Nobody is changing decisions I have made. In the aftermath of this, the authors who were disqualified, of course, have made statements, including Rebecca Kwan who posted saying, I initially planned to say nothing about Babel's inexplicable disqualification from the Hugo Awards, but I believe that these cases thrive on ambiguities, the lingering question marks, the answers that aren't answered. I wish to clarify that no reason for Babel's ineligibility was given to me or my team. I did not decline a nomination as no nomination was offered. Until one is provided that explains why the book was eligible for the Nebula and Locus Award, which it won, and not the Hugos, I assume this was a matter of undesirability rather than ineligibility. Excluding undesirable work is not only embarrassing for all involved parties, but renders the entire process and organization illegitimate. Pity. That's all from me. I have books to write. <laughs> God damn, hell of a statement and absolutely correct. Please note, this is not someone complaining that they weren't nominated. They were, <laughs> the statistics are there. They should have been in and were just plucked out for no given reason, or I guess, asked and answered. Paul made a statement as well saying, so after a long day, the final stats for the Hugo Awards are now out and you can see them for yourselves. I noticed there are some very strange things in these numbers, including a number of people and works deemed ineligible without further explanation. As it so happens, I am one of those people who are deemed ineligible. I had the third highest number of nominations, but on the long list, I got a asterisk that says ineligible without any further explanation. I have absolutely no idea why I was ineligible and I believe I am entirely entitled to know why I was made ineligible. Specifically calling out Dave at the end of his statement saying, I deserve answers. You want the truth? 
on the official post where these statistics were released, we have also seen people involved with Worldcon and the Hugo Awards responding, specifically one response from Kevin here, where he then eventually links to a post where he does fully break down and explain how the award ceremony goes. And I do want to get into this because it does clarify responsibility to an extent. Now, Kevin is the person who made the post that does go over the final statistics. This is someone deeply involved with the process, so I trust they're saying how this works is correct. Here's what they had to say. Worldcon is not really a single convention. It's an ongoing series of one-shot events, each of which is run by a separate legal entity with extremely weak oversight that mainly amounts to hoping that the organizers follow the rules they agreed to follow. The World Science Fiction Society is not a corporation with a board of directors that makes all of the decisions, specifically about where Worldcons are held. The site of Worldcons is determined by a vote of the members of the Worldcon two years earlier, which we previously talked about. That is, the members of the 2021 Worldcon in DC voted to select Chengdu. I hope I'm saying that right. There is no entity that evaluates subjectively the suitability of the site. In order to be able to vote on the site of the Worldcon two years from now, you have to join the current Worldcon as at least a WSFF member, which costs around 50 US dollars these days. And then you also have to cast a vote in the election. Several thousand people joined Worldcon 2021, mostly from China, and voted in the last few days before the voting deadline in 2021. The administration of the Hugo Awards is entirely in the hands of the current Worldcon committee for that year. As others have noted, there is no entity that is superior to the individual Worldcon committee. The rules of the World Science Fiction Society are not imposed by board of directors or some other small select committee. They are voted upon by members of Worldcon in a meeting held at published times at each Worldcon. Any changes to the rules have been passed in two consecutive years in order to reduce the chances of a single interest group packing the meeting in a single year, voting away the store. You have to be an attending WSFS member to attend and vote at the meeting, but there are no other requirements. And I I want to say I completely understand passing the buck in that way. It does make it sound like, hey, it's not your responsibility. And you've put in safeguards to make sure that no one single party can hijack the rules and sell away the store. But a massive glaring issue in this process has just been brought to light. An individual host with their own agenda can have just as big an impact with no vote needed, it seems, because they have just disqualified authors with no reason given aside from, well, if you're connecting dots, they don't seem to align with the party values of the country that they're in. As you can see, this is a very complex situation, but at the end of the day, it seems like there's a, in my personal opinion, who's handling a lot of the communication in charge of this, who's condescendingly talking down to people and dismissing complaints, despite the fact that a Hugo Award can massively affect someone's career. And as an end result, it's becoming blisteringly apparent that some people were disqualified from winning a Hugo Award, allegedly, purely because their politics didn't align with the host country. So I have long thought that the Hugo Awards were kind of crappy, and this whole scandal kind of lets me know why I've had that feeling for quite some time. Being a decentralized award that hops from country to country does sound neat, but having no oversight and basically making it impossible to adapt or adjust for anyone who has an agenda on the local level any given year is a terrible, terrible idea. No hate is meant towards Kevin who did that write up. And overall, adapt and change or continue to be ridiculed and die. Before we move on to the next news, a quick word from today's sponsor. But first, I wanna give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Paired. So full disclosure, Kayla and I have been using Paired, the relationship app for couples for well over a year now, which means we've actually been using them since before they became a sponsor on the channel. And upgrading to Paired Premium has only made it more enjoyable. We started using it because it felt like a small but meaningful way to just show each other some love throughout the day. And it sparked so many conversations that will then like come back to on a road trip or something. It's just made this neat little conversation pit for us to pull from if we're ever bored. It's super fun, easy to use, and is constantly updating with new games, quizzes, and activities, so it never gets it's boring. They also have quizzes like emotional intelligence or relationship check-ins, as well as games like Would You Rather and Favorite Things. As you guys might already know, our favorite pack to do is the You or Me game. And they've even been an inspiration for some of our recent date nights. It makes you talk about things you've always wanted to try and do, and so you just end up finding a nearby class and book it. It's like relationship lubricant, not that kind. Deadass seriously though, because of Paired, Kayla and I ended up going paintballing together. It was so much fun. I kicked her ass. I kicked her ass. I I kicked her ass. She'd never been before. I do not hold back on shooting anybody with a paintball. Even you, Kayla, she can attest to that. 
So whether you're looking for a date idea or to forge a deeper connection, go ahead and check out the link in the description down below to get 25% off your paired premium subscription and deepen your connection with your partner today. Back to the video. It's 8 p.m. and I just finished doing the first half of this fantasy news and now need to just even start the second. So please forgive me if this is a little bit more bare bones than you're used to here on the channel. Your goblin's just tired. But because people always ask when I get a new chair, uh, this is a Herman Miller chair. Uh, make and model on screen if you want it. I didn't buy this, it was a gift and I love it. I just wanted to avoid those questions. <laughs> and then also, if you've been wondering who won the Juniper Wheel of Time giveaway, their name was Matt. I shouted them out on Twitter. If you want to go see their exact handle and everything, I'll have it on screen now. Uh, they did the winning by my randomly getting their name from a number generator. Uh, I did think it was funny that someone named Matt won, and I, I referenced that in my announcement. And now on to the rest of the news. Let's kill it! This next news is genuinely so exciting, I'm feeling the life come back into me here, and that is the Broken Binding has revealed their first major piece of art for their upcoming Malazan run, and oh my god! Yeah! It looks so good, it hurts! Jesus Christ! Huge shout out to Felix Ortiz for this work and mega shout out for Patrick Leo for being involved in this project as well. Two of the greatest uh, people in the community putting in work and I, I so appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so if you're one of the people who wants to be getting a new run of Malazan, which is really hard to come by, check this out, link down below, as well as everything else talked about here. And then in some normal cover reveal news, we had probably my favorite concept uh, get its cover today in terms of a book I've come across recently, and that would be for Mushroom Blues, The Hoffman Report, book one by Adrian M. Gibson. And this is what you think. It is a fungal punk book. Some ask, have we gone too far creatively? I say nay. I say we are just coming to the cusp of greatness. And this is absolutely on my TBR. Fungal pump? I'm in! This will be out March 19th of 2024. And the full artwork is on screen now. I wanna give a massive shout out to the cover artist for this. Would you guess who it is? Once again, Felix Ortiz! This is a guy who we should all be grateful for in the sci-fi fantasy community space. He just, he just delivers us gems left and right like it's nothing. We also got another poster for Netflix's soon to be released Avatar The Last Airbender live action in anticipation to a trailer that's supposed to be out today. As you're watching this, I'll try to have a link down below. And it looks like it follows the typical formula that all posters follow now for bad movies and or shows. I hate this formula for posters where it's just like accumulation of center people. Stop that, do something interesting, different. It's Avatar, four elements, so much creatively you can do with that. And this is what you, okay, yeah, whatever. I, I'm sure some focus group somewhere has decided this is the perfect thing. I guess. And if you've been wanting a little bit more mystery in your fantasy news, let's stir it on in there. Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan, two heavyweights, are apparently teaming up for a vampire-related secret project that we do not know much about, aside from the vampire element, and that it'll be somewhat of a period piece. This could be anything from, hey, Dracula again, to a total reimagining and reinterpretation of the origins of vampire all the way back in the day before Dracula's influence. I'll be keeping an eye on it because I like these two creatives and I'm a bit of a vampire fan, I've realized over the years. I'm not like every day a vampire fan, but when I see a vampire in something, there's just, I'm a part of that generation, I guess. I like me some fangy boys. And if you are a Cosmia fan, we have also a fan-made trailer drop for Stones Unhollowed, The Way of Kings. Don't put pressure on them, the release date says, eventually, but this looks to be a fan passion project that's an 8-bit or 16-bit side-scroller where you get to play as, well, let's just say the prologue of Way of Kings without spoiling anything, because not everyone here has probably read that. And that's pretty neat. Uh, the gameplay really seems to weave in some of the powers that are showcased in that prologue really well, and I definitely want to check this one out. And then in the last bit of fantasy news, because my throat is going and I'm still sick, we are getting a Highlander adaptation with Henry Cavill attached and the director behind 
John Wick. And if that is not a pairing that gets your little stunt double tingles tangling, I don't know what would be because that just sounds kick ass. So, and it's time for today's self pub promo. Please remember to submit yours to the Discord channel and not by email. And today's book is Heart of Fire by Raina Nightingale, book one in the Dragon Mage series, pitched as a fresh take on classic epic fantasy featuring female leads, a focus on non romantic relationships instead of battle scenes, and a world with ancient non medieval vibes. Camilla has always been told that humans are inferior. They cannot use magic. If they bond to dragons, they will doom the creatures to extinction. She has never believed a word of it. She has always known that she can use magic, and she suspects it is the elves who harm the dragons by keeping them to themselves. Now she is presented with the opportunity of a lifetime. A dragon's clutch is hatching, and while she will earn the wrath of her captors if she is caught, she has the chance to see a dragon hatch, and perhaps even to recognize. Kario's people have feared dragons since time immemorial. When an unrealistically huge black dragon flies in while she is hunting, she is certain she will die. Instead, her life is changed when Nalexi, obsidian guardian of Arer, chooses her as her final rider. Kario takes the name Flameheart, but she is soon homesick and afraid that she is insufficient to be the partner of a god. As I was signing out, the memory card got full in my camera. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I I do here and that last minute death, baby. Oh, peace.